I think we can start. Welcome everybody. It is a great pleasure to see you all here with us in our third and last uh, and final Meet the Experts live session of our online course of uh, the Acerusia Hybrid University. I am Vicky, an Education Officer of MIO, and today together with uh, my colleagues Iro and Olga, we will be facilitating the meeting. Uh, very shortly, a few words about the uh, housekeeping. Uh, as you may remember from the previous session, uh, this uh, live uh, will be will have interpretation as well. So uh, we have English and French simultaneously. If you want to follow the meeting in French, just click the bottom at the bottom at the bottom of your screen and change the channel. Um, this meeting will be recorded too in order to be available for those who couldn't make it today with us. So feel free uh, if you want to turn off your camera at any time. And uh, something last about the background noise. Uh, this is why you have been automatically muted as you entered the meeting. Uh, that's all uh, about the housekeeping notes. Um, now we kindly ask you to write in the chat uh, your country and uh, city. So let's see uh, which are the places for today. Um, I see Greece, Athens, uh, Zagreb, Croatia, Amman, Jordan, Casalnovo in Italy, Alexandria, Egypt, uh, Hania, Greece, um, Italy, Navarra, Milan, uh, Thessaloniki, Egypt again, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Rethymno, Greece, Greece again, um, Croatia, Gospit, Romania, right. Crete again, uh, uh, Silento in Italy, Po Delta, very nice, Belluno and so on. Right. Um, we move on with another energizer, uh, this time by Iro. Iro. Welcome everyone from me as well to the third and the last session of um, this uh, Asterusia Hybrid uh, University. Uh, in the previous two uh, sessions, we began with a poll. Uh, this time, we prefer to start with another uh, energizer that will give us uh, also some um, insights from you. But in order to do that, uh, we, I, I would like to ask you to switch on your cameras because it is important that we see you. So in order to um, uh, start this energizer, we will use our hand uh, I will ask you some questions and you will reflect uh, uh, your answers using either one, two, or up to five fingers. We are all set. Those who are not shy to unveil their face. Okay, first question. So what is your level of energy right now? That's nice. A lot of fours, some threes. We're okay. Well, let's see how we are at the end of the meeting. Second, second question, please. Um, how important do you consider online learning in general? From one to five. I see. A lot of fives, some fours and some threes. Okay. Of course, we are joining an, an online course. Naturally, <laughs> we, we believe in the value of uh, online learning. One more question for you. Um, it's the third week so far in the platform. Uh, how familiar do you feel with the e-course platform that you, we have been using for the last uh, three weeks? From one to five. Okay, glad to see a lot of fives. 
and some force. Happy you are enjoying it and uh, finding it um, easy to use after three weeks. Uh, before we um, introduce um, our experts, that's that's all for the energizer for uh, for the, <laughs> the time being. If you feel uncomfortable, you can switch off your cameras. However, it is better for us to see you. Uh, I would like uh, some to make some uh, comments on uh, the evaluation of the second week. Uh, so in the Padlet, some of you um, requested for more live meetings. Um, as you know, we hold, we hold one meeting per week. Uh, we thought that this would be an average um, in order not to ask you to commit to further uh, time in a live session. Um, however, in the evaluation, in the general evaluation of the course, if we have this, um, this request by many of you, we will see uh, what we can do in the future. Um, we think that once a week is, let's say, an, a balance in order to avoid the, um, what happens uh, for many of us during this crazy year, um, which is uh, called uh, death by Zoom. <laughs> we are all um, participating in many web uh, conferences, live or uh, non-live uh, sessions. And uh, we wanted to keep this to, to the minimum so that we can have interaction. However, we would uh, not ask um, some, so much commitment from you. Uh, regarding the timing, someone said that Thursday may be too soon to hold such a, such a meeting. Uh, however, uh, statistically, uh, Thursdays and Wednesdays are the, the, the days in the week that are more popular for having such uh, interactive sessions. So we wanted to avoid to have uh, Friday or weekend, of course, in order uh, to have as many um, as possible from you online. And hopefully that from this conversation, even if you haven't followed all the videos of uh, the second week, you are able to follow and then go back to the videos and, and read um, from another perspective um, what you are watching. Uh, someone asked for more discussions on management plans and challenges. Um, okay, regarding this, since last week uh, was our focus on uh, management, um, the way that we have uh, structured the course so far is to have um, to, to give content that would uh, as much as possible satisfy everyone because we are coming from different backgrounds. Not everyone is a manager in a biosphere reserve uh, in this group. Um, so we wanted to, to, to keep it in a balance the amount of content and the interactions we have. Um, I would like to uh, invite everyone to join in or go back to the Padlets. In the Padlets that are scattered within the course, we ask you for group, group reflection. So the more you reflect from your own experiences on management, education, or whatever aspect we discuss in each Padlet, the more it, it, it is for us and for your core learners, of course. Um, and the last request, uh, since we have people from Creta here, we, uh, many people asked to visit Asterusia. We take this uh, note and hopefully in the next years after this uh, pandemic is over, we will uh, be able to host the session there. So without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, invite our um, uh, first lecturer, Mr. Bernard Comp. Mm, Vicky, you want to mm -hmm. okay. take over? Um, as we did in, in our previous weeks, uh, uh, you can ask uh, or uh, upvote uh, 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 the key lecturers of uh, today's meeting. So please check uh, the chat about the slide link, which I'm uh, copying right now. In case you wish to add uh, a question or to avoid the already existing ones. 
Uh, now, uh, our week's experts start with uh, Mr. Bernard Gombes, is uh, part of the UNESCO ESD for 2030 uh, program and framework team. Uh, he coordinates implementation actually of two of the five priority areas, uh, the ones on local level actions and on youth. He also works in cooperation with other agencies in communication, education and public awareness in the areas of biodiversity, water, ocean, cities and sustainable lifestyles. And Professor Michael Skoulos, who is our scientific coordinator, as you all know. So, uh, dear Bernard, uh, welcome. We are happy to have you here with us. And let's start with your questions. Uh, starting, uh, starting with the first one uh, by Yosef, uh, societal change needs time and I'm afraid that 10 years are too short for a big transformation, given that we're talking about transformative uh, uh, actions and uh, uh, activities. So how can we accelerate uh, these impacts of ESD? And uh, another one. A question for you is to uh, elaborate a little bit more on how we came up from GAP to the ESD for 2030 and what about the GAP uh, network partners, how the previous GAP partners can join this uh, one and only ESD net. Bernard, the floor is yours. Hello, <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the questions. <laughs> um, let me well let me say first that i'm very happy to be able to at least meet virtually with uh, some of the course participants i would agree that it would be nice to be able to actually be, be there in, in person but this is our new norm um i'll start by the first question yes of course 10 years is not a lot of time but we need to we need to be positive. We need to think positively. Uh, if you look at what happened in 2019, from the, the end of 2018 to the end of 2019, we had all these uh, Fridays for the Future climate marches. When they started, everyone was like, oh, yes, just uh, some noise in the street, nothing is going to happen. But by the end, we saw that there was a, ch a lot of change that came ab about. Uh, including a number of countries being taken to court for not doing enough on climate change. Um, of course, governments all, uh, all responded, but we're already doing a lot. You have to understand it's difficult, it's complicated, that we all understand. But a 10-year period, I mean, is a good time. We know that not everything will be fixed, not everything will be achieved, but already we can build on what has already happened in countries there are quite a few countries where esd is already there it's already taking place even if in some cases it hasn't been fully acknowledged by the ministries but at the local level it's there it's happening in many uh, many biosphere reserves there are things that are going on which are esd so how can we scale that up one one way is a course like this because you're 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 interacting with other participants you're finding out about what's happening in terms of management in terms of uh, education and the biospheres but you also can talk about that um, it's also bringing different actors together at that level because the biosphere reserve is not just the manager and the people who look after the biosphere reserve it's the people who actually live in the biosphere reserve, which we can be people who have nothing to do with education, but are there, are contributing to that, that place. It's schools. There are schools in biosphere reserve. There are schools next to biosphere reserve. Uh, my my big, biggest recommendation is that if you're a school or if you're a teacher in a school that's not far from a biosphere reserve, use that place basically as a learning material. Uh, yes, it's important if we are sitting in Europe to learn about uh, what needs to be done and with the Amazon forest, but we have our own forests in Europe, in the Mediterranean. So let's use the opportunity 
to focus on that. I mean, there are other actors near and in Biosphere Reserve. There are private sector companies. There are just regular people, regular citizens who live there and for them, it's their place because it's also education is also a question of about culture, about how, who we are and why we are there and why we're doing things. So to scale up action, we have to bring these different actors together with a common purpose. What is the common purpose of ESD for 2030 for the next 10 years is to improve education, make sure that education and learning, not just in school, anywhere, at any age, is relevant to the reality of things happening where you are. That's one thing. Second thing is about making this conscious um, transformation that yes, as a citizen, I can change things. One simple way uh, is voting. When you're voting for your mayor, voting for your local government or even your national government, there are certain issues if you do, do not agree with them, you, you do not vote for those candidates. Do not be blind and just go, oh, well, I always voted for this group, I will continue. No, if you feel that the Green Party in your country is not doing things, don't vote for the Green Party, vote for somebody else, vote practical. I'm sorry, you invited me as a UN person. I'm sorry, I'm not your typical UN staff and of, I can be not too diplomatic, but this is the reality. If we want to change things, we have to take those things into consideration. There was a question about uh, how did uh, this new ESD net, this new network? Well, we are still debating, discussing <laughs> what to do with this global network, because a network, even a small one, even at the local level, is always difficult to manage because the more people join it, the more you want to make it inclusive and that everybody has a say, a voice, but it takes time, it's complicated. So the question we have been getting is from former Global Action Program key partners, how do I get into this new network? One, one answer is, as I explained in my, in my presentation, was that one of the focus of ESD for 2030 is pushing countries to develop these country initiatives. So the first place where the gap partners would connect would be at their national level. That's for, because the number of gap partners are really national level gap partners. Some are more regional level. So it's to also connect with what's happening in their region. Some are at the global level. There it's to really push along uh, what's happening. We So at this point, we have not established a platform where you can see who will be in the network yet, because we are in a whole discussion of, well, if we start listing who's in the network, you know, should we just list the name? Should we put more information? Um, this might be changing over the years. So the idea is we, we want to make this network as, um, well, as open as possible. The comparison is that during the global action uh, program period, the, the network was in a way limited to more or less 100 partners, which was a, f a frustration for people who were not in the network. They, were, they felt they were not part of the club. So now we're saying, well, no, we're opening it more widely, but we are still, uh, discussing what would be key components to make this work. Because our idea is that everybody can contribute to make ESD for 2030 advance. Now the transition from the global action program to the new program, which has the same five priority area action areas. So you'll probably say, oh, you've kept them because nothing worked. <laughs> No, it's not that. It's that things take time. Uh, you know, capacity building. If you're training teachers, you can only train so many per year. If you, I mean, ideally, we should retrain all the teachers around the world. That is quasi impossible <laughs> because 
it's a, a lot of logistics to put in place. So how did we, how do we move? We did consultations. We, um, we had small uh, symposiums, workshops in different parts of the world. Uh, for instance, we had one in Japan in a small, small town called Omori, uh, which used to be an old uh, mining city, which now uh, gets a lot of uh, city people who want to get away from busy city life to come to a quieter area. So there we brought, uh, actually, we, we went to Omori two times. The second time, we brought a number of ministers of education. We took them out of their offices. We put them in, the, in this village for three days, and we had to meet the local people and hear the, you know, the real issues, which often they don't hear when they're sitting in their ministry office. We had a meeting in uh, um, an old mining town in Germany. We had a meeting in Brazil. We had a meeting in, in uh, South Africa near the shanty towns near Cape Town. To there, we discussed the issue of livelihoods and poverty. Um, all these meetings with different people from different disciplines brought out some to uh, some uh, concepts. Those were in part that's how we came to these uh, three elements I had described in the in the um, in the in the presentation I did. We also consulted our member countries. And many of them said, oh, no, you cannot get rid of the five priority areas. We've, start, we've just started working on them. We need to keep that. So for us, yes, because those were clearly the most important priority areas. The, the big change, I would say, is that um, we have moved to putting a back of focus on country level, that country ministries need to get involved. During the gap, some of them were like, well, you have this group of uh, 100 partners. They're the ones doing the work. We, we don't really need, we don't feel like we are involved. So we're now telling them, well, you need to get involved. We're also using the excuse that this is also the decade of action for the SDGs. So to put that emphasis there. And, um, and then the other thing was also looking more at the, that education for sustainable development is more than just talking about environmental issues. It's also talking about social issues, about cultural issues, and about economic issues, and how to weave all of that. Basically, it's about how do we create better societies and that are more sustainable. So that's kind of a quick answer to some of these questions that were posed. Um, uh, I would be happy. I will in the chat. I'll put some links for where people can get more, more detailed information. Um, so, at this point, that's that's my answers. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mr. <coughs> um, I would like uh, to invite Professor Skoulos. Of course, you can. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, I would like to ask Professor Skoulos, of course, you are welcome to comment on uh, the issues we have been uh, discussing so far uh, regarding the, this big transformation we have in front of us uh, for the next uh, 10 years and the networking possibilities and so on. But um, we have some more uh, questions for you coming from the Slido. Um, so Pietro asks, uh, in the EU, we have an old population. So a big problem is not only youth, which is our focus this week, but the majority of the citizens. How can we convince them to live in a sustainable way? And another general uh, question, if you can comment, uh, Maria asked, uh, uh, how to become an educator? Does it take uh, specific skills? I don't know if you can make it. Uh, synthetic reply to this? I will try. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Bernard first for uh, what he said. Um, to make it a little bit more interactive, I have to say that, of course, it is very difficult to find a, a solution with no, uh, with only uh, pros and no cons. <laughs> Um, and uh, I do believe that um, 
both decisions uh, not to have the gap and uh, um, reorient to countries or it was all, always there um, have some uh, uh, negative impacts in the sense that at least in some areas like the Mediterranean, the regional level is the one that can mobilize the countries much more than directly from UNESCO to the countries. And this has to be understood. We have raised that many times. And uh, the same is true to some extent also in, in the UNICE region, at least part of it, which is very well known also to you. And uh, the inclusiveness issue is indeed very important. We, we really want to have everybody uh, with us, uh, not leaving some, someone behind. On the other ha hand, if you don't have drivers and people who feel responsible in multiplying the messages of UNESCO, uh, through their own networks, feeling responsible for that, I think um, things go slower than expected. So just keep these two, um, because these, come, these uh, observations come out of many years of uh, experience in, this, uh, in, in both the UNESCO system and uh, ESD. Now, <clears throat> on the questions um, uh, you, you, you raised, um, I start uh, with the uh, issue uh, on ages, on age. No doubt, um, sustainable development is something to be uh, particularly important for the young people because they are going to drive the future and they have to embrace it all the way through. However, we started uh, understanding already that we have the worst racism against the old people and the third uh, age people. And uh, uh, this goes against the natural wisdom uh, in all traditional societies, there is a respect for the wisdom of the old people, and we should take as much as possible from their wisdom. So there should be a combination between the two. We need to educate them because um, education for sustainable development, as Bernard said, is not defined only in educational systems or young age it is a lifelong education. And even wise people need to reconsider and revisit their views. So for sure, non-formal and informal education is equally important. And uh, I agree that we need to take into account also the age distribution in the different parts of the world. And in Europe, we need where many of the uh, older people uh, are um, so much, uh, let's say, accustomed to specific uh, consumption models. We need to work also there with them. It is important uh, to balance things, always to have a balance. This is the, 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 the first thing. On educators, there are people who say that educators are born. This is true to a certain extent. There are people who like this very much, like to transfer their experiences more than other people. However, educators, the competences of educators and even educators for sustainable development uh, have been analyzed we need, uh, uh, there is already a system that we have uh, developed uh, in uh, UNICE and in the Mediterranean for competences. And uh, we need for the educators, particularly those who are going to work on ESD, 
to strengthen several of their, let's say, competences, the systemic thinking, for example, the transformative, the, the tendency uh, to, to be uh, their teaching uh, transformative, uh, accept the uh, learner-centered uh, approach. Um, these are very important. And uh, also to understand better. And uh, two things, to be, as Bernard said, to, be, to, to make a statement about what he believes, but at the same time, accepting the views of others and trying to build the necessary understanding and consensus, not making, uh, you know, um, the analysis should be realistic. At the same time, you have to conduct policies and learning in, a, in an optimistic way. And these are the key, let's say, characteristics of uh, an educator dealing uh, you know, with sustainable development and education for sustainable development. Uh, I don't know, I don't remember if there was something else um, that I left out. Uh, um. Thank you. Very, thank you, Professor Skoulos. We will come back to us okay. uh, a little bit later. Now we would like to welcome Laura Negri, a sustainable tourism professional. Uh, she is one of our youth experts uh, invited guests for today. After representing Laura, the Italian Biosphere Reserve of Pond Delta at the first and the second MAB Youth Forum and the UN Youth Climate Summit, she embarked in founding a youth association, My Delta. So dear Laura, we would like to elaborate a little bit more about your association. The, the questions that the trainees posed to Slido had to do uh, about the difficulties that you, uh, that you faced and encountered, uh, encountered in the process of making the association and how you succeeded to overcome these difficulties if you were taken seriously at the beginning by the others and how, how did you motivate uh, others to join in uh, to come on board in this new association and last but not least what about engagement practices that you used did you activate social media campaigns uh, discussion uh, workshops and things like that so yes yours thank you yes hello everyone thank you for for uh, inviting me to this uh, to this uh, virtual university i was really happy um, to be to be asked for uh, for this intervention and yes, there are many questions on the table and I'll try to be as synthetic as possible. Um, yes, I, I agree with, uh, with Professor Scolus. I'm not sure uh, that I pronounce his, uh, his surname correctly, but- uh, Like school, yes. like school. Scolus, <laughs> yes. And I agree with, them when, uh, with him when uh, he says that we need to find a balance because um, between uh, all the people and, and young people that the both, both uh, groups should be taken into consideration and should be uh, work, should work together because indeed, uh, mm, so this, is, this re relates for, um, with the difficulties we had because as an association that we, um, that we create, we had of course internal difficulties because we are a group of uh, young people and everyone has uh, different ideas, but these are um, easily overcome when, when, you discuss, when you discuss. But I think that the biggest difficulty we, we have, and I don't have a, a magic formula uh, to that, is then when, when we understood that, that um, basically youth is uh, taken into consideration when it comes uh, to um, uh, top-down approaches. So when uh, it's um, when people and like uh, governance and uh, um, want to involve youth and the ideas of youth then are taken into consideration. Uh, but when it comes uh, to youth having ideas and want to uh, create 
um, their own opportunities. So I speak more about bottom and it's harder to uh, accomplish what, what you have in mind. Um, on this side, I don't have, this was the main difficulties we found. So when we got something that was proposed to us, it was, it was okay. But then when we wanted to propose something, uh, it was very hard uh, to, to, to pursue this path. Um, so the, 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 only, the advice is try, try and try. And if you do not succeed, try again. And if you don't succeed, then you move to the next idea. And at a certain point, you will, uh, um, you will have something that, that is accomplished. And, and I think like young people, they have the motivation to do that. But at certain point, and then now I speak um, about Italy, um, which has a um, different mentality um, and different culture, um, sometimes youth is not very much taken into consideration because, um, so I, for example, political class in Italy is um, older compared to other countries. So this is already a sign that uh, uh, we should move the system forward. And I know that it takes time. And this is, um, this is what concerns difficulties. Uh, but you have to be motivated. And well, the, the second question was if they're taking us seriously. Yes, they were taking us seriously uh, because um, even, even if we were young people, we, uh, we created this association uh, from a big event. And this was what was, I was telling you from of these uh, top-down approaches. Um, we created this association from, from a big event that was the first MAP Youth Forum. And on the territory, it was a big event. Um, everyone was knowing about it and many people were involved and it was a UNESCO event so um, yes everyone was proud that we, we created this association to uh, to help the territories and um, and I also um, read that the um, uh, question was what motiv motivate us um, basically um, the fact of being part of um, such an um, important event uh, feeling um, being part of something that big and also having the possibility of um, talking with many different people uh, coming from all over the world, there were more or less 300 participants, um, gave us this motivation to pursue this, um, to, fund this uh, to fund this association and to create something on the territory. Because at a certain point we, uh, we were um, in the position that other people coming from all over the world were uh, showing us our territory. Uh, so we, we certain, in a certain way, rediscover it because we were taking it for granted when you see something every day and it's always the same thing, you, don't, you, you do not appreciate. But when, when someone else shows it, um, it's, it's something different. So this is, uh, 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 this is what motivates us at the very beginning and put everything in, in motion. And about the activities, yes, this was the, the, the other question. Um, we did different activities depending on the people we were talking to. And the uh, approach was always the same, more or less. It was uh, like practice, uh, like theory plus practice. And um, for example, with uh, little children, we, 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 do, we did something really practical like experimentations. Uh, for example, we, um, it, we uh, we brought, like, we asked them to bring battles that where they had to recreate the, the ecosystems. So it was really practical with, plant, with plants and dirt so that they could easily understand. On the other side, with um, students. Uh, so we talked with these uh, local, local students of, the, of our Biosphere Reserve. And basically, we had two approaches. Uh, one, it was uh, through social media, as I mentioned, and basically we understood that uh, um, the value of um, a territory, it's also given by its inhabitants. So, as I said, the inhabitants should be aware of what um, surrounds us, uh, surround them. Uh, so um, it was more or less a storytelling exercise. Uh, so since social media is a tool that everyone, is tools that everyone uses, um, we encourage them to take pictures uh, and of the territory of what uh, what surrounded them, and to link the, to link uh, um, pictures with their stories, their personal uh, emotions, and so then they could see 
where they lived in a different way, as we, as it happened that, uh, to us that uh, we took part to this forum. And then um, we also uh, encouraged them um, to create uh, like uh, um, tourist itineraries uh, in the uh, of, in the biosphere. Uh, so then we could understand point one what they knew about their own place where they were living, and uh, point two um, um, that they could also uh, um, learn that this is uh, this could be a this is a tourist destination, and there is much more to discover compared to what they uh, they knew. So and this they were really enthusiastic because they knew that uh, um, they they knew they, they discovered that they knew so little compared to different destinations, uh, and they took the territory for granted and we encourage them to um, target different kinds of tourists for example couples families and to build also the um, let's say the excursions and the activities that they could do if they were couples families or um, um, other kind of tourists on on our territory uh, so this helped them to to rediscover a bit and then uh, when it came to local uh, civil society, local communities, we, we had like a, um, an approach that was like more or less like presentation uh, and then a discussion. Um, we organized conferences and like occasion to, to debate with, uh, with, uh, with the civil society. And yes, this is more or less the, the answer to the, the question. If you have more, I'm very happy to, to answer. Thank you for giving us uh, the, list, the list of practical uh, tips and things we can do actually in a biosphere reserve, because this was also asked uh, from us in the evaluation of the second week. So we have uh, already a checklist of things that uh, simple things we can do with our students and the local inhabitants in, in order for them to see their place with a new lenses. We have been discussing uh, about that uh, throughout week three, I think, from many of the presentations coming from the young people amongst us. So thank you, Laura. Um, coming back to uh, Bernard, maybe um, we can, um, or before we go to Bernard, let's, let's check a little bit your energy. So I will uh, ask everyone for one minute to switch on your cameras, please to see that you are all uh, alive and kicking. So this time we will not uh, use our uh, hands. This, uh, this time we will use our, um, we will not use our fingers. We will use our hand as an thermometer. So if we tend to agree with what I ask you, you so here, so we can see your hand. If you tend to not, ag not, uh, ag not agree, disagree, you place your hand here. So let's see that all cameras are on. Oh, nice to see you. So first question, uh, what is your energy right now? Your level of energy? B please be honest. Ah, good. Happy to see these hands. Um, coming back to the e-course. Uh, it's our third and final week. Some of you are progressing already. Some of you are a little bit behind. So, um, how much have you progressed in the e-course? Let's see. Oh, I see some very good students <laughs> in the front screen. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, well, I see the really committed ones for this course are, are joining this session. Very happy to see so many hands uh, here. Uh, third question. So how important do you find uh, education and specifically education for sustainable development within a biosphere reserve? If you find it very important, so and so. I think we <laughs> I see some hands uh, over the screen. Okay, so we are all uh, believers of ESD. Happy to see that. And how important do you find the role of youth in a biosphere reserve? Naturally, thank you for your contributions and happy to see your faces. So we move on to the discussion now. 
I would like to go back to Bernard. We have two questions for you. These are kind of technical questions, but maybe you can share your experiences from what you know uh, as regards to the um, infusion of ESD. So Maria asks, um, have you seen differences in countries where ESD infused in all subjects of the curriculum compared to those that keep it as an autonomous subject? And one relevant question is uh, if you have seen differences in countries where ESD is mandatory as a school subject uh, compared to those that keep it on a voluntary extracurricular basis, uh, such as we do in Greece. <laughs> Very good <Yeah>. technical questions. <laughs> um, um, Yes, there are clear differences. I think the first, the first thing to remember is that um, you have different levels within the education system. So to infuse or mainstream one topic into everything, it's much easier at primary school level because basically at primary school, you have one or two teachers and they have to teach all subjects. So they, there's, in there, there's no problem. It's when you go to secondary level that the problem starts because still in many schools around the world, when you go to a secondary school and you talk to the director of the school, they say, oh, ESD, that's for the science teacher. And you're like, no, <laughs> maybe the science teacher can be the main person, but it can be taught in other subjects. And then when you get to university, that's even worse because it's like, oh, you can only do ESD because you're doing a degree in, I don't know, <laughs> some kind of scientific thing. Um, so yes, we do see differences um, by the, the education level. Um, there are also differences in which ministry runs the schools. Because for instance, many people forget that Actually, the first ES, good ESD or even very good environmental education in many countries was actually done by agricultural schools run by the Ministry of Agriculture, which in many countries, when you talk to the Ministry of Education, they say, oh, agricultural, no, 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 they're, in a way, they're not serious schools. It's, it's for people who, who can't think. It's, for, it's this the discrimination within the education system. But they are very, I mean, there've been some very good, good examples. Then you have the problem of countries. Uh, France is one of them. ESD by decree has been put under the mandate of the Ministry of Environment, but it's the Ministry of Education that has to implement it. So in some cases, the Ministry of Ed Education said, oh yes, but we're not the main one concerned by this. So if there's not enough money, it's not our problem, it's the Ministry of Environment that should do it. So there, are, you find that in other countries also where ESD, because somebody high up in the government thinks it's very important, says, okay, we have to give it to one ministry to take care of, but sometimes it's not the Ministry of Education. That's one part. Um, the, the big challenge is that to be able to make sure that ESD is everywhere in all the subjects, it means that you have to go back to teacher training, that teachers are trained to, okay, you want to be a math teacher. So yes, most of your courses should be about math, but there are other subjects that are also important that you need to integrate. That's one element. The other element is that within a school, especially a secondary school, ESD needs to become a project of the teaching staff. That the science teacher needs to cooperate with the history teacher or the geography teacher to talk about ESD, the ESD issues or environmental issues in a way that goes into the different classes. Um, making it mandatory or not, uh, even mandatory topics in some countries, still you don't really see it in the classroom. 
it's in the text, it's in the textbook, it's in teacher training, but the problem is in, in particular in Europe, so many issues are becoming mandatory. Uh, yes, you have to teach ESD, but we also have to teach multicultural things. We have to teach about uh, you know, tolerance and all. So suddenly the teacher has all these mandatory things they have to do and they say, sorry, there's only so many days in the week and I only see my students for such a short time. I think what's more important, whether ESD is mandatory or not, whether it's fully integrated, it's better that it's infused in different topics rather than just a standalone uh, topic, is that the, it's more the learn, in a way, the learning methods that are put behind it. It's that the, whoever teaches it needs to show that there are connections between everything. For If you look at the SDGs, the 17 SDGs are all connected to each other. So you have to make the, you have to show those links and then you have to, to use the, um, an example that might not be part of your own curriculum. Go back to the issue of math. If you're a math teacher, well, I mean, you can talk about the forest in math because then you can do these exercises. If there's something that you can, a practical thing you can do in a biosphere reserve that has a forest and then trees, can you estimate the height of a tree? It's a math question. So you can bring that in. I think it's, uh, it's also about um, making things uh, back to what I said before, making things relevant. That yes, why am I, uh, why am I telling you uh, about ESD or about this particular topic? Is to connect it to things that students are facing. Uh, for example, the issue of uh, transportation. Right off, you might say, oh, transportation, that's not ESD. <laughs> it's a thing, it's a, no, actually, in part it is. Because transportation is me meaning moving from one place to another, moving one good for no to another place, moving the grapes to the, <laughs> to, the, um, to the wine cooperative, and then the bottles of wine to somewhere else. That's part of ESD. It might not look like it or sound like it, but it's about, is linked to the issues of consum uh, consumption, the issues of production. So the infusing ESD into education and learning is making these links and connecting to the reality of life, I would say. And then in terms just to pick up on ESD is for all ages. And as he said, Whatever your edge of the age of your generation, you can contribute. Potentially, every one of us is a teacher and an, edu an educator. Every one of us can teach something else to someone. Doesn't have to be ESD. Doesn't matter. But you can contribute. And in terms of again, back to biosphere reserve. For me, biosphere reserve. One of the important elements is that in French we have this word terroir, basically this portion of land, this territory, has specific characteristic, whether they're geographic, historical, by a uh, link to biodiversity, or the way people live in them. This is the heart of the matter. This is who we are, what we are, and what we need to do to keep having a quote unquote sustainable life. And there ages come in remembering what the elders are telling us. It's how, for example, in terms of disasters, um, earthquakes and all that, in some parts of the world, you've, you people are surprised that when there's a, a disaster strike, there are very few people who are killed because people have learned from generation to generation to pick up the signs that something is going to happen, so we better we better move away. Uh, in 2005, there was this tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Some islands, they, nobody was killed because they saw the sign, they had learned the signs, and they had moved up the, up the hills. So when the waves came, it was just the houses that got destroyed. So ESD, it's also about this transmission of knowledge just by stories, just by looking at how you do things. 
that's where, of course, online can help. You know, you have tutorials for everything, but the best tutorial is to actually do it with someone. And in particular, if it's someone that's from that same part. So um, for me, that's at the heart of embedding ESD into education, into learning, is to also make connect it to the local, the local knowledge, the local needs, to, because that's, it'll make more sense. It's also one way to be inclusive, because then when uh, student, kids come home from school, they can actually engage with their parents, with their grandparents on some issues that make sense. I didn't give a technical answer because... <laughs> it's okay. I think it's very inspiring, your answer. And uh, you touch upon um, a concepts that we have been discussing in week three, but also in the previous week, such uh, as um, the power of multipliers. Many speakers have stressed that. Um, becoming ambassadors for uh, uh, the BR values, something that we have discussed uh, before. Um, the issue of mentoring was uh, mentioned also by some of the speakers of uh, this week and how uh, we transfer our experience and um, our motivation from one to the other. Um, just uh, as, as I was hearing you, um, maybe we can do another uh, check using you as a sample. We are not so many, we're about 60 people, but uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you, using again the, the, our fingers from, from one to five, um, to what extent you have been exposed, let's say, to uh, SD and ESD in your um, studies at the tertiary level? Let's see. Let's use our fingers from one to five. Let's see as a, a sample what... Let's see, everyone... Not so much, eh? two or three mostly. Oh, I see some fours there. So there are, there's a lot uh, of things to improve in the way we uh, infuse ESD in the curriculum also in our studies. Okay, maybe Vicky, you want to, you want to proceed with? Uh... Yes, I think uh, that now again, Professor Skoulos takes the floor and uh, we focus uh, a little bit more on uh, Greek context now. We have some questions regarding uh, ESD in Greece and in particularly the Centers of Environmental Education. So Maria Yanakaki asks uh, why the Centers of Environmental Educations, uh, Education are degraded in, in Greece and how BRs can make them stronger um, with their presence in Greek society. And another one uh, from Anonymous is um, how can a government enhance the ESD when it has a different perspective for education targets such as technology and especially the Greek one? We cannot hear you. Can you please unmute? Yes. Um... I have to say that um, for the first, I don't quite agree that uh, the uh, environmental education centers are uh, degraded. Um, as far as I know, um, they have been now um, actually given also the title and the man mandate to work on um, ESD as well. Uh, and uh, for those, uh, for the non-Greeks, I have to say that in Greece we have a, a rather innovative uh, scheme, uh, very important I, uh, when I compare it with many other countries. In each one of the 50, 53, 54 um, uh, prefectures of the country, we have uh, a center, uh, environmental education center or now education, environmental education, education for sustainable development center with uh, several um, educators. Uh, and this center in many cases is placed near a protected area or within a protected area, in, not in all cases, but uh, in proximity to areas that can also 
be used as, a little bit as biosphere reserves. And uh, um, schools from all over the country visit these centers and spend one, two days uh, discussing uh, projects of uh, education for sustainable development. It is true that uh, in, uh, I mean, a few months ago, there was a discussion about uh, reducing the competences or the number of uh, people working there. But as, uh, as far as I know, this has been changed again. So the centers are, as far as I know, uh, quite uh, active. Um, in fact, we have visited one of these centers in the first phase of uh, the Asterusia University in Crete. And uh, the, the center itself there, as far as the infrastructure is concerned, is a very, I think I, I was uh, so happily surprised to see the infrastructure. And also they have their own wine, wine yard and a garden and other things to show to students. Of course, there is a lot of room for improvement. And we want to keep them and have them stronger and stronger. On the second thing is difficult to answer. I think the, um, there are, uh, unfortunately, uh, quite frequent changes in uh, leadership in uh, ministries, including the Ministry of Education, and um, different people who are responsible come with uh, um, emphasis, put in emphasis on different things. We don't, uh, we didn't have uh, uh, from the leadership any commitment for sustainable development. We've heard a lot about technology, that's true, about um, uh, communication technologies in particular and other things. But um, again, I don't think that um, uh, whenever they come with an emphasis in an area, this means that the other areas are not uh, considered or taken into account. We all of us who work with the ESD and uh, also with um, non-governmental organizations, the civil society, we wish to see a much greater commitment for sustainable development from the Ministry of Education. And coming back to what Bernard said before, um, in many cases, uh, we have the ministries of environment closer to us. Traditionally, um, the ministries of uh, environment were the first uh, who worked for environmental education and for the Mediterranean strategy on ESD. We presented the Mediterranean strategy on ESD first to the ministers of environment. And we had the blessing of the Euro-Mediterranean ministers of the environment first, adopting the strategy. And then we brought the strategy with the action plan to the ministers of education. Uh, in the Mediterranean, not only in Greece, uh, ministries of education tend to be more conservative um, than ministries of the environment. This is a general observation. This is what I have to say. Thank you, Professor, Professor Skoulos. Um, I would uh, like to come back to um, some of the young experts we have uh, with us this week. Uh, and uh, is it any or no? I, I see here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So we have a question uh, for you, Irini. Uh, so actually, um, Irini represented the, the, the MAP program uh, in the UN um, Climate Youth Summit uh, last year. So the question is, uh, in what ways did you infuse the learnings of this uh, important uh, climate uh, summit uh, in your work or studies or projects? Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Mediterranean Information Office 
and all the other organizers and supporters for hosting the Sterosia Hybrid University, despite all the challenges um, that we're facing now. Uh, it is with great honor that I'm given this opportunity to share my experience of my participation in the United Nations Youth Climate Action Summit. On account of the summit and in my involvement in it, in it it has incited me to continue with my studies. Currently, I'm finishing my master's, which is on sustainable management of forests and natural ecosystems. And moreover, during my studies, I have had the chance to do research projects on climate change and deepen my scientific knowledge on the topic. Um, furthermore, taking part in the summit has also helped me to broaden my horizons and share my experience and knowledge with others, um, getting involved with other uh, youth organizations such as the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, um, in which I am an active member, and we do a lot of um, climate activities. Also, it has inspired me to encourage and empower youth to make their voices heard in the global debate on climate change. I use it as a tool through social media to encourage the youth. Lastly, um, in my free time, I'm one of the head team leaders in a hiking group in Northern Greece, um, where we organize many hikes in trails at Mount Olibrox Biosphere Reserve. And during these trails, uh, we inform hikers of the importance of the Biosphere Reserve and the environmental protection and the consequences of climate change on biodiversity. Coming back home from the United Nations uh, Youth Climate Action Summit made me realize that there's still a lot of work um, to be done to engage the younger generations in climate action. We need to teach youth about um, how climate could affect their present and future lives and how their involvement is necessary in all aspects of society, from a community level to a governmental level. Increasing communication and enabling uh, more conversations are the most important pillars to raising awareness and to strengthening the youth climate uh, action movement to a national and uh, international level. Through the summit, um, it made me also more aware that you should not only wait for decision makers uh, to bring change, we, the younger generation, have to take action on a personal level immediately. Um, climate change is a battle of survival and we are losing it and time is not by our side. As was emphasized um, at the summit, all youth from all countries uh, must contribute towards a global effort by doing their share. And this is the biggest lesson I learned at the summit, which I'm truly trying to implement right now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Wow, you've been quite active since then. <laughs> Very nice. Sharing, and uh, exchanging, and peer learning it's, uh, can be really powerful. We move on now with uh, Katrin, Katrin Tomova. Uh, we're pleased to see you in this um, Meet the Experts uh, uh, too. Katrin uh, is an environmental scientist from the Bulgarian Biodiversity Foundation. She was organizer and hosted the last year's uh, 2019 Summer University in the Central Balkan Biosphere Reserve. And uh, Katrin, welcome. Um, the question we have for you is um, if there was any project idea or uh, an initiative or a kind of network that was born after the Summer University in uh, Central uh, Bulgarian BR, and if uh, such a new, newborn, let's say, project and activity is now growing, do you have something to share with us about it? Yes, thank you, Vicky. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see familiar faces. Uh, it's a really great opportunity. Thank you again for uh, inviting me to share my experience. 
Now, with regards to the question, um, there is no formal initiative for a network. Uh, if you're referring to, for example, the My Delta that Laura shared, no such thing was created, maybe because the summer university is not such a large event as the youth forum was. Uh, however, my main idea to, to organize such an event was to to bring the MAP program to Bulgaria because I couldn't bring all the stakeholders to the youth forum or to the summer university. So I decided that the smartest thing I could do is just to bring the MAP program to, to my country and to the stakeholders and uh, to just inspire them to start uh, thinking, to broaden their horizons and to start networking. And I think that this was achieved um, as, um, as a project that was initiated after the summer university was uh, a network networking idea organized with the German Biosphere Reserve. Um, it's called the Thuringian Forest. I don't speak German, but it's uh, the Turing Forest Biosphere Reserve and the uh, Central Balkan. There was a study visit and um, a joint project uh, that was funded by the German um, ministry related to opportunities and challenges in Central Balkan. There was also another project that was um, developed based on the ideas that came out from the summer university. It was mostly focusing about branding, about developing a brand, logo, banners, uh, so all those um, activities related to marketing. And the project was developed, uh, but unfortunately it was not uh, funded. However, it is now ready to be submitted again in different uh, funding opportunities. And uh, as I said, uh, I just want to underline that many of the ideas were taken from the summer university and many of the activities were developed uh, based on the outcomes of the summer university. There were also two interns at the, in the park directorate that are now uh, working on uh, biosphere reserves topic. So they're working on the Facebook page, they created an Instagram page. So all those uh, little baby steps uh, have been uh, started and initiated. And um, this is what I actually wanted to achieve with the organization of this event to get things started. And from that onward, um, I think that uh, we have the, the enthusiasm and people are inspired to, to continue on their efforts and uh, on this journey. Thanks a lot, Katrin. We are very happy and um, pleased and satisfied to see that the, these summer universities are, are not only a nice time we have in these beautiful places that we visit every year, but they um, act as incubators of project ideas or further where networking and um, this online uh, series that we have for the last three weeks uh, actually proves that because many of the people uh, that we have here are uh, former uh, learners and uh, happy to see them as lecturers in a future uh, session. Uh, so I would like to, to come to Dimitris uh, from Asterusia. So from uh, Bulgaria, we come back to Greece. And uh, there is a question for you, Dimitris, um, who is, um, Dimitris has participated in the second uh, MAP Youth Forum in China. In his video this week, he shared his experience about this event and uh, how he tried to transfer it in the Asterusia reality. So um, the question is, what measures are taken in Yasterusia in order to engage youth and children to participate in practical uh, activities in the Biosphere Reserve? Or maybe we can, um, uh, 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 since we had the, the, the uh, previous conversation on also on wider groups, the general public, maybe older uh, generation as well. So what has been done so far or what you, are, you mean to do in the next, in the future? Hello, everybody. Greetings from Crete. And of course, I would be very happy to, to guide you here on my island if you have the opportunity, maybe next summer, if the pandemic is eventually over. So to go straight to the question, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, the Biosphere Reserve in Asterusia, as you most probably know, so far is very recent one, so we are still at the very beginning of uh, our actions. Uh, the same applies also for the youth network uh, established in uh, the Asterusia region. Uh, so uh, the measures taken so far to engage the youth and uh, in children in, uh, in practical activities. Uh, actually, we are experiencing one of, uh, of these measures. 
right now the phase two of uh, the Asterusia Hybrid University. Here, uh, the locals had the opportunity also to participate in uh, phase one of the university and actually uh, engage with uh, the local population and local entrepreneurs who are acting in a sustainable way. Meet them and see how they are trying to survive in the modern uh, world, but staying uh, uh, positive for the environment and the sustainable development of the area. And the next thing that uh, we are planning to do with uh, actually not us as the youth, but uh, the Mediterranean Information Office and the Heraklion Development Agency are uh, planning some pilot projects on uh, educating young students in uh, the terminology and in the principles of sustainable development. So I believe that uh, this will uh, help us a lot to create a, a new generation, a generation that will be more uh, uh, euphoric and uh, eco-friendly. And uh, if uh, we want to connect this uh, question also with the question regarding the aging of the population, which is uh, a huge problem in Asterusia, uh, I think that uh, what uh, we can uh, exploit, what we can try to achieve is to uh, connect uh, the, the youth who are uh, by definition more open to uh, new ways of implementing things in their everyday life and in their professional life, to connect these uh, youth with, uh, through their families, uh, with the older population and try to uh, try to pass them this new way of uh, living because it's a way of living. So maybe we can exploit the, the strong family bonds uh, currently established in Asterusia and in Crete in general and uh, uh, achieve something uh, also for the older population. I don't know if I answered the question or if uh, maybe Professor Schoolers wants to add something about this pilot project, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we'll have still a lot of things to do and uh, uh, we are open also to uh, proposals from our youth from uh, the rest of the regions. The only thing, uh, thank you, Dimitris, the only thing I wanted to add is that um, what we observed also during the summer university, um, two things. One, uh, as part of the university, we have asked the young people to interview the old people. So they uh, collected and they, they recorded these uh, interviews, uh, which are extremely interesting uh, because they started asking what they remember, how they used uh, the different products, the different practices, all these kind of things. I think even this con contact and even the way in which old people were so positive in giving their impressions and making statements was for me extremely uh, interesting and important. The other thing is uh, uh, what uh, uh, Dimitri said, I mean, that they have started already a new group. Of course, it's very beginning, uh, but this group also brought in even few young people from other um, areas, from uh, G uh, UNESCO geoparks and other areas uh, together uh, to work uh, in Asterusia. I think this is also very interesting and it includes uh, part of um, uh, replication uh, potential. So I think, um, uh, and the third is that the uh, education uh, community, including the, the Center of Environmental Education for Sustainable, they recognize the, um, the, the, this uh, 
group of youth as their allies in uh, uh, approaching uh, particularly um, small groups in Asterusia where you cannot uh, have uh, direct links with uh, more organized, let's say, in educational intervention in schools. So uh, youth is uh, well placed for um, passing some of the education messages, supporting actually uh, people in remote areas. Many of them are very old. And what we try in Asterusia now is to bring back uh, young people there through the enterprises of the area. And uh, so the, the, the group of uh, uh, the youth group will have an important role to play, encouraging also uh, young people to come back and um, passing the message from what we have some visionary young, relatively young people who um, started business in the, in the region uh, with good results. Of course, COVID has um, <laughs> raised too many difficulties uh, for some of them, particularly in the area of tourism, but uh, we keep fingers crossed that this will be uh, over. So I, I, I wanted to stress that uh, they have started already very important uh, interventions. Thank you, Professor Skoulos. Let me now introduce you to uh, introduce our uh, last but not least uh, invited guest, uh, Ms. Jing Fang. Uh, she's a junior expert at the UNESCO Venice office. She works in the area of biodiversity at the national and international level. She has been involved also in the MAP program for the last years. Uh, Zing, welcome. Um, Zing uh, uh, presented uh, during the course, uh, the online course, uh, the MAP youth program and how uh, it engages young people um, through various modalities, either as uh, partners or uh, leaders. So, Zing, uh, the question we have for you is uh, this. In your own role within your work context, do you feel more like uh, co-shaping, acting as a partner, or enabling, acting as a leader? If you would like to elaborate a little bit more on these two types of engaging you through the Youth Mom program, it will be very interesting. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicky, Ro, and uh, Professor Skulo, and everybody, every uh, young people here. Uh, it, it's, I'm really happy to be here to, to discuss with you. And um, I listen quietly, I uh, take notes, um, I learned a lot from you. So it's definitely a peer learning. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I would like to uh, introduce, as mentioned by uh, Vicky, uh, these two uh, types of uh, youth engagement. And in fact, it is uh, these two uh, types of uh, youth engagement uh, was identified in the, um, by UNESCO in uh, meaningfully, uh, meaningful youth engagement uh, strategy. And so uh, for type one co-shaping, uh, co-delivering, uh, that means um, uh, youth act as partners in uh, the planning, development, uh, implementation, monitoring, and even evaluation of um, the, 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 relate, uh, the re relevant initiatives. And uh, for type two on uh, enabling, uh, I would say it could be um, sort of um, um, more demanding a uh, type uh, because it seems uh, yeah, young people uh, will uh, act as leaders in the initiatives. And so um, um, young people would like to have uh, sort of more uh, support from the, from, uh, from the agency, from the authority. And uh, I would say that uh, both of the activities are very important. They are sort of complementary. And um, the co-shaping and uh, co-delivering activity seems uh, more common 
And um, we are trying, and I work for the uh, UNESCO Regional Bureau in Venice and our team, uh, we are trying to uh, explore the, the potential of use in actual planning, uh, our actually planning our activities, uh, projects by uh, really engaging the right young people to co-shape the activities and projects. And actually, we are involving uh, some key young uh, stakeholders in the uh, past and also future uh, symposia and uh, projects. And we are connecting uh, with uh, the young people in planning uh, some of our projects in our PIDER sites. And so um, I would say that young people have a lot of roles to play. They are part of the youth group, um, but go out of this group. They can be scientists, young scientists, they can be young professionals, they can be uh, uh, young people who live in the biosphere reserves, they can be sort of uh, some young educators. So, I mean, it, it's really interesting to, 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 to do this, um, uh, how to say, to go in and go out so that we will have a bigger picture to see uh, how we, uh, how we do things and where we stand. And um, uh, for the enabling activity, it's true that it's more difficult, but uh, I should say it's very important. As mentioned by uh, Laura, uh, I like very much the, the way uh, she put the bottom up approaches. So uh, we would say the top down approaches and the bottom up approaches, they are uh, also complementary in the whole cycle of youth engagement. And so for the top down, as for you, you, you know already and mentioned by a lot of um, young people, the MAP Youth Forum, uh, we young people, we gather together, uh, we uh, get inspired, and we uh, create this sort of peer learning session, we identify possible uh, follow up action that could be tested and implemented in, um, in the biosphere reserves. And, um, but for the, the bottom up approaches, I, I would say that for the, um, uh, for the young people, it's true that we should try, we should um, overcome the difficulties, and we should also make our voice heard. And for, um, I don't know, for us, I mean, I'm also a young people who work sort of in uh, the regional bureau in, um, uh, for UNESCO. We are trying to go in, um, in, um, in a right direction, sort of in a good direction to try to do something in this field. And that is the way forward. And um, just one last message on the pipeline, uh, we are planning a um, webinar uh, dedicated to uh, use in uh, UNESCO sites, including biosphere reserves and uh, UNESCO um, geoparks, trying to identify uh, the use good practices for the uh, green recovery um, uh, after the um, uh, COVID-19 in their sites. And so maybe it would be a, a starting point for us to, to, to learn more about um, the experience, good ideas of young people to identify the good things. And we can try to see how uh, we can come in, how we can structure all the good practices, good ideas, and how to promote them to the uh, bigger world beyond your biosphere reserves and let everyone uh, hear our voice and see our story. And I will stop by this and thank you again. Over to you. Thank you, Jing. Uh, I think this uh, course is a, um, uh, a proof that uh, it's both uh, co-shaping and enabling as we have all these young people uh, through enablers of uh, the MAB uh, Youth Network. As we are running out of time and um, uh, we don't have uh, 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 um, we don't have any time regarding the assignments. If so, if you have questions, specific questions regarding your assignments, please send us, send these to um, the info at medias uh, our usual um, 
email, but uh, maybe I can give the floor to Bernard and Professor Skoulos for, for some um, uh, general overall closing remark, uh, remarks. From my part, I would invite everyone to go back to week one and week two learning content. Now that we are closing the loop and um, doing our assignments, maybe we can see also the video lectures of week one and the padlets that we share content in a, in a new way. And this can help us, um, help us to complete our assignments. So uh, Bernard. Uh... Before I give my concluding statement, I just want to uh, pick up on this issue of youth and youth being heard and being, I just would like to remind everyone that prior to the Global Action Program, we had the UK, UN decade on ESD. And actually what, who started the transition from the decade to the Global Action Program? It was actually youth. We, we used the resolution that was adopted at the UNESCO Youth Forum of the Youth Forum saying we need to pursue mainstream uh, scale up ESD. And we said, look, they have said that, we took that, we used that to do a consultation, which led us to choose the five priority areas for the gap and many other elements. So yes, youth can be heard. Uh, so do not, for those who feel, oh, no, no, it's too difficult. As uh, Laura said, try, try again, try again, and yet again, try. It's, uh, you know, you learn, you learn, you relearn. Okay, my, my, for my concluding things, very, I'll just repeat uh, something I said in my recorded presentation. Remember the four C's. First C is communication. You need to talk, you need to share, you need to communicate about your own biosphere reserve, your own, what you're doing with others. Second, commitment. Clearly you have shown that you are committed. You're taking this course, you've shared. Keep that commitment. That commitment can be your passion. It can lead you to, you know, the dream, quote, quote unquote, the dream job. <laughs> Fourth, um, collaboration. We cannot do this by ourselves. We have to work together across sectors through uh, from by one biosphere to another, across countries, across regions. You know, we have the, the MAB youth, uh, youth Network is a great network for sharing ideas between biosphere reserves, which might not seem to be the same because they are different parts of the world, but actually might be facing the same problems and coming up with the same solution. And the last one, I think the most important one, is community. All the alumni of these summer, summer universities are forming a community of both practice, but also of sharing, of feeling there. You have a group of people you can go to to move forward and try and find solutions for your own biosphere reserve. And also the larger sense that we are we are all in it together. We need to move on with that. So that's my my five cents of <laughs> of concluding remarks. Thank you very much again for this opportunity to exchange virtually. Professor uh, thank you. I would like to start by thanking also Bernard for being with us, but also all uh, the young lecturers, younger lecturers. We are younger. Uh, to, um, is not age what makes somebody young. Uh, so uh, thank you very much indeed. I do appreciate the commitment of everybody. Um, from the chat, I have uh, just to, to, to uh, respond to Marie Therese say from uh, Lebanon saying, uh, uh, well, we have to remind uh, Mediterranean governments that they have accepted and approved the action plan for the education for sustainable development and have to put some resources and some uh, legal frameworks in place. We, have, we are going to do that together also for Lebanon. Um, for uh, the rest, I, I cannot answer all the points. I understand that there is uh, already a reply for uh, 
the issue of elephants and um, from uh, Bernard. Um, but I would like, uh, perhaps we'll have the opportunity to give more, um, have some uh, more exchanges. Um, uh, Bernard uh, ended with the C's, so I would like also to end there with the I's, because uh, <laughs> as you remember, uh, particularly in, um, uh, in um, management, uh, we have these eyes, and uh, I insist uh, again and again at all levels to say that education for sustainable development is perhaps one of the most powerful tools for the good management of biosphere reserves. And I said that there we need the good management uh, is the link of uh, implementation and integration. We want something to be implemented, but in order to be sustainable, it should be integrated with all other policies. And to have that information and education in the widest sense, um, innovation, involvement, of course, some investment, but also international cooperation are very important all both for the way in which we deliver education for sustainable development and the way in which we use it as an important tool for the right management of biosphere reserves but also for transmitting the, the spirit and the message of the biosphere reserves to the entire society. And you are now the ambassadors of this message. I'm very glad that we had so many today, fewer, but all of them will attend. I'm sure we have, um, uh, I believe that this uh, is a very, was a very successful university. And uh, I am uh, sure that you all finish uh, your, um, uh, exams, <laughs> and perhaps uh, uh, Iro may say a few things about uh, the finalization and how they get also their certificates. Thank you once again, all of you. Allow me to thank also the interpreters and allow me to thank uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, Iro, Vicky, Olga, and everybody else uh, who, uh, together with the great support of uh, the UNESCO uh, Regional Office of Venice, managed once again to conclude. Uh, and um, hopefully, we'll see you um, in uh, Asterusia and in other places, because as you know, every second year, we have the meeting in Greece. Mm. But uh, in between, we have other countries. If some of you uh, work with uh, biosphere reserves that are willing to undertake uh, some of the organization, we welcome you for suggestions. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Skoulos. I am a very punctual person, and I see that we are already 10 minutes after uh, um, the end of, we were supposed to end 10 minutes uh, earlier, but everyone knows in this, um, this call that the final deadline for all assignments is the 31st of um, December, and the certificates will be then granted in the beginning of January. If you have specific questions regarding your assignments, please email them to us. Uh, please copy and paste all the resources that have been shared by Bernard in this call, uh, very useful re uh, re resources on conflict management, climate change, education, and so on. And I would like um, to wish you all a happy and a safe uh, holiday season if you're going to have some time off. Um, and uh, of course, ask you to switch on your cameras for the last time for this, uh, for this e course in order for us to say bye bye to everyone and uh, salute you in a proper way.